lot of people. Uh, yes, we were in the right place at the right time. Our equipment functioned properly, everything worked, we survived, we were victorious. And timing is important in life, isn't it? But there's nothing free. We have to work for what we get. And almost always that's a whole lot of hard work over a number of years. The average MiG battle over Hanoi took place in some 60 seconds or less. Our longest was a minute 29 seconds on the 8th of July, 1972, when we were lucky enough to down two MiG-21. What I'm saying is that in an instant of time, everything that a fighter crew has worked for and trained for and studied and learned over a period of 5, 10, 15, or 20 years has to come together and link up and happen and gel. It, ha it has to happen in a very short period, and we had to be ready. We had to be prepared, and then there were no substitutes, no excuses. And we spent many, many hours of study and critique on the ground for every hour in the air. Teamwork, very little we can do alone in life, particularly in the sophisticated world in which we live, the complicated environment. There's certainly no way we could have flown over Hanoi by ourselves and survived, much less downed enemy airplanes. Working together was absolutely essential to that mission, the front and back seat in the airplane, the eight members of the flight of four, the 200 plus in the strike force, the refueling tankers, the Army, the Navy, the Marines, the rescue forces, the Allied radar and intelligence sources, the ground crews, the maintenance and support personnel, the C-3 command, controlled communication, the special forces, the EW, the electronic warfare, the engineers, the resource management, the combat support groups, the photo squadrons, the cooks, the docs, the medics, all of the various individuals and agencies and organizations that, that joined together to support the successful conduct of a very complicated and sophisticated mission. Now think about it this way. If a fighter crew's done everything else right, and the missile doesn't come off the rail, or it doesn't guide, or it fails to detonate, or if the radar and the computers fail, or if the gun jams, or if the radio malfunctions, or if the EW gear doesn't work or gives false information, or if the intelligence information was incorrect, then not only is the battle over, but it may not be possible to survive. Well then discipline, extremely important to success and survival over Hanoi, just as it was in the desert, just as it is in our everyday personal and professional lives. And it required pretty strict team, personal and flight discipline. And uh, Chuck, I don't know if you remember, but on the 20th, actually you did because you talked about it last night, the 26th of August, when a breach of discipline by one of our wingmen just about cost us four airplanes and eight people. So what I'm saying is that once prepared, and then when working as a team, discipline is the way that we, that we wrapped it up, put it together, made it work. I'm really talking about what I like to call positive, positive discipline as opposed to negative discipline. Negative discipline being that which is imposed through threat and fear and intimidation. We all know those kind of situations, don't we, and those kind of people. While positive discipline results in an instilled desire to win, to achieve, to be the best, to be victorious. Positive discipline, whether uh, in the cockpit, on the flight line, in the supply arena, in the classroom, on the athletic field, positive discipline causes one to self-impose the highest personal standards. And aren't those the best kind? The ones that are self-imposed? Now we hear a lot today about quality. We talk a lot about quality Air Force. And I'm sure that's emphasized here quite a bit. Empowerment. Chuck talked about empowerment last night. What I really believe empowerment means is ownership. And as, uh, as we discussed last night, we didn't know that the word empowerment uh, 22 years ago this summer. I mean, it was in the dictionary, but we didn't use it. We weren't talking about quality, but we had some leaders that understood it, what it really means. Charlie Gabriel was a wing commander, later chief of staff of the Air Force, and his policy was that the most proficient and the most qualified people led the flights. That makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, would you want someone unqualified leading a flight into combat? I mean, it's just basic common sense. I don't know why we have so much trouble in it. Sometimes rank and ego get in the way and we end up with people in positions that there shouldn't be. But Charlie Gabriel understood it very well. Uh, 
And what that meant is that uh, generally the captains and the majors were leading the flight, and the old lieutenant colonels and colonels were flying on the wing where they ought to be. Now, <laughs> now Colonel, then Colonel Gabriel was by far the best of any of the colonels on base. Would you agree? Uh, two MiGs in Korea. Now, you would think he would be out leading every flight trying to shoot down three MiGs and become an ace with them. But he was smarter than that. Because he understood that the, that the people who were doing it every day, who were the most proficient, most qualified, should be leading the flight. So, <clears throat> most of the time, he flew number three, many times in our flight. And one time we got down, one day we got down, I had led the flight, and he said, Steve, I believe I'm going to lead. I believe I'm going to lead tomorrow. I'm going to lead the flight tomorrow. And I said, yes, sir. Well, we got to the 5 a.m. briefing the next morning, and the schedule read, Richie leading and Gabriel three. And I said, boss, I thought, I thought you were going to lead. And he thought for a moment, and he turned and looked at me, and he said, he said, I had planned to, but you always do a better job. You lead. Now, how about this? From a full colonel, wing commander, MIG killer, to a 29-year-old captain. You talk about empowerment. Uh, you talk about giving us ownership of that flight. Did we lower our standards? We raised our standards to a degree that they never could have been reached otherwise. We would have done anything for that man. We'd have done anything. I would have done anything to have kept from ever disappointing John Gabriel. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that's empowerment. That's quality. And in order to empower people, we have to trust them, don't we? You see, the communists don't trust the individual. The MiG pilots that we flew against were not trained or allowed to think for themselves in the air. They were controlled by a ground radar controller. They were told almost everything to do. They had very little flexibility. Would you say that's a limiting factor in a combat situation? <laughs> Would you say that's a limiting factor in a job situation? Well, of course it is. We have to trust people in order to empower them. Now, are there some people who are going to take advantage of our trust? Well, certainly there are. Well, we deal with those on an individual basis. Uh, one of the things we've done over the years in the military is when somebody screws up, we make a regulation that prevents anybody from ever doing that again throughout all of history. <laughs> Don't we? And pretty soon we end up with so darn many regulations we can't do anything. So when General McPeak came on board, he said get rid of half of the regulations and cut the other half in half. You know, let's give people at the working level the ability and the opportunity and the tools to do the job. And that's what Charlie Gabriel and Jerry O'Malley and Jack Bessie at UDAR 22 years ago this summer understood very well. It's one of the reasons. One of the big reasons, uh, along with all of the tremendous support that we had, that we had the success that we did. Now, um, I always like, uh, what I'd like to do, uh, ending up here, I don't know how much of time we have. What's our scheduled time? Uh, well, an hour and a half, two hours. No, that's too long. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, even, even for the four of us, that's... That, that's too long. I, I, I do always, uh, when possible, like to tell about the 8th of July uh, in 1972 when we downed the two MiG-21s a minute and a half because it's such a great example of how, how all of the elements of the team effort come together to produce an incredible victory. Anyone see the movie Top Gun? Anyone more than once? Anyone more than five times? <laughs> like grandkids. <laughs> well, it was a lot like, like like part of what you saw in Top Gun. I know some of the ladies are thinking about Tom Cruise. Uh, <laughs> and maybe some of the gentlemen are thinking about Kelly McGillis, uh, but we're talking about the flying. <laughs> the flying was very exciting and dramatic and, and fast moving. Well, the last thing that happened that morning before we taxied is the crew chief came up the ladder to let me know we didn't have any film for the camera. We're in an F4E model with a gun and a gun camera. Most of the time we were in a D without a gun camera. And I said, what do you mean, chief, there's no film? He said, we're out of film. There's no film on base. Well, I thought about that for a moment. I said, uh, well, I guess it's okay. I, I doubt if we'll see MiGs today anyway. He said, we never know, do we? That's a darn important lesson when you think about it. Because we never know what's just around the corner. We never know what's just over the horizon, do we? 
That's why we need to be as prepared as we can possibly be. And you know, there's some of us who believe that the world is still a dangerous place. In fact, history tells us during periods of instability like we have right now, there's even greater danger. And we never know. So we need to be ready. We need to be prepared. But uh, since we, uh, we are somewhat limited in time, what I'd rather do is just spend a few more minutes and, and tell a story that I told last night, uh, which was the most thrilling and exciting and, and challenging and heartwarming mission that uh, I think the four of us would agree that we, we could ever have known about. And it was the rescue of Roger Locker. Roger Locker was shot down on the 10th of May in 1972, and for 22 days there was no word. We, we carry survival radios right here in our survival vest, one on each side and lots of extra batteries, because there's no way to make that rescue without the communication link. Proper communication, so important in every single thing that we do in life, every day, all day long. Just think about the problems caused by miscommunication. It's unbelievable, isn't it? We end up going to war over it. Anyway, we went back in that afternoon and called and called on the radio. There was no answer, and we, we went in for days thereafter, and there was never any reply. We finally decided that he must have been killed or captured, <clears throat> but he never came out on a captured list that the North Vietnamese like to publish every couple of weeks. Well, 22 days later, we were flying in the same area that was breaking the radio chatter. You can imagine with 20 or 30 airplanes all on the same frequency, all trying to talk at the same time, and to, it does get a little tight. In fact, I have a little piece of tape. Let me grab it here. <coughs> or it gives you a feel for what it sounds like under those conditions. I guess I left it in the car, so we'll go without it. Uh, but uh, as you can imagine, it, uh, it does get a little busy uh, under those conditions. But there was a break in the radio chatter. Call came over the air. Any Allied aircraft. This is Orster Zero One Bravo. I remember thinking, Orster, we, we don't we don't have an Orster call sign today. And then we realized that that's Roger Locker. We answered him. This is exactly what he said. He said, "Guys, I've been down here a long time. Any chance of picking me up?" <laughs> and he said, "You bet." You bet. Went back to our respective bases that afternoon, quickly planned a rescue mission. We came back in. He was five miles off the end of Yen Bai Airfield, almost 70 miles northwest of Hanoi. The deepest rescue ever attempted. But the ground fire from Yen Bai was so heavy that we had to back off. Couldn't get him out. Went back home that night. As you can imagine, we were pretty, pretty frustrated, pretty, uh, pretty down. This is our friend. This is someone most of us knew very, very well. He was on his third combat tour, over 400 combat missions. Not only did we admire and respect him greatly, but he was one of the neatest young people that many of us had ever met. And now we found him after all this time. We'd located him. We knew where he was, but we couldn't get him out. And of course, now they knew where he was, and very soon he would be captured. Well, the next morning, in one of the great examples in in my opinion, a courageous leadership. General John Boat, VOGT, the four-star commander of 7th Air Force in Saigon, canceled the entire strike mission to Hanoi and dedicated some 150 airplanes to the rescue of Roger Locker. And we went in and for about two hours we made sure that the guns at Yen Bai Airfield were silenced. Then a young 27-year-old Air Force Academy graduate, Captain Dale Stovall, class of 67, commanded the lead of two Jolly Green John helicopters. And, and I'm always so proud to tell this story because, you see, Dale was a freshman when I was a senior, and I, I had a little bit to do with his summer training his first year. <laughs> Dale commanded that lead of two Jolly Greens, came in, sent, some, sent the jungle penetrator down through a heavy canopy of trees, and snatched Roger Locker as he was about to be captured. Selected full power, pulled him out of the jungle, into the helicopter they headed out. We flew cover for the two Jolly Greens and their C-130 refueling tankers as they made their way out of North Vietnam. Brought him all the way back to Udor in Thailand. General Boat flew up in a T-39 from Saigon, was the first of several hundred of us to meet him as he 
stepped off that chopper after 23 days. The flight surgeons, the docs, the nurses, the medics quickly took him off to the hospital. But they did say he could come to the club that night. <laughs> 1900 hours, 7 p.m. for 30 minutes, and the word spread. And the club was absolutely, totally jam-packed. And at 7 p.m., Roger Locker, washed, fed, shaven, and dressed in a uniform that we called our party suit, walked in the front door. Applause broke out. It lasted for over 20 minutes. As he made his way through the crowd, shaking hands with friends, a magnificent experience of human emotion. An incredible victory against all odds. Against all odds. Didn't he excuse me, sir? Didn't he marry one of the nurses? Yes, he did. And when you think about that and analyze it and compare it, say, to the theme of that movie, Platoon, which suggested that we shoot at you shoot each other in the back. And then we come to fully understand the effort to which we will go, the resources we will commit, the risk that we will take to rescue one American, one crew member, one ally. Doesn't it become a pretty powerful statement about what kind of people we are, about the value that we place on life and on freedom? and on the individual, and about the marketplace in which we all operate, which is defined by tremendous respect for the individual and for economic freedom. And of course, without economic freedom, we ultimately lose all other freedoms. And it's one of the reasons we're in business. It's one of the reasons we do what we do. It's one of the reasons we wear this uniform. And it's one of the reasons that all of the people involved in the support of this effort are doing what they do is to help preserve and protect an environment where people can be free and reach their full potential. You know, Air Force, the Air Force and, uh, and aviation have meant so much to so many of us, certainly so many here in this room, more than most of us could ever have imagined. As John Gillespie McGee wrote so beautifully, we have indeed soared up that long, delirious, burning blue, put out our hand, and touched the face of God. Thank you. Southeast Asia. popular war. It was a war that had gone on for a long time. Summer of 72 and a little earlier than that, we were in a long lull from going into North Vietnam. The units, the unit that we were in, the Triple Nickel Squadron, had maintained an air-to-air -air commitment through four years of not a lot of air-to-air -air activity. So there was nothing to really sink your teeth into other than the mission. A group of people came together early in the spring of 72, just by chance. I came in from another unit in the States. The rest of us came in from various other places. And it just happened to click. But it wasn't just that we clicked, it was also that we were a team. There was leadership available and followership, integrity, honesty, discipline. We were 100% dedicated to what we did. Not 98%, not 99%, 100%. Because if you're only 98% dedicated to the mission, that means that 2% of the time, you're not. And I can't allow that. That 2% of the time is in a critical period up in North Vietnam. 
We may have all died. A lot of people flew in, uh, compare Southeast Asia to Korea and the exchange ratios we had in Korea. The 14 to 1 exchange ratio we had against the MiGs. We were fighting in a place in Korea called MiG Alley. It was a long way from friendly airfields and a long way from enemy airfields. The fuel loads that the airplanes, both the enemy and the friendly airplanes, had to have to get home was about the same. In Southeast Asia, it was a little different. We were fighting 300 miles, 285 miles to be exact, as the crow flies from Udon to Hanoi. We were fighting over Hanoi in a lot of cases, or in the area, over their fields. When they ran out of gas, they spiraled down, they landed. When we ran out of gas, all of us had reservations at the Hilton. Of course, there was not a 2800 number to call for those reservations. So, our tactics, our teamwork, our leadership, <coughs> our operations drove our very survival. Discipline was absolutely a must. And we had that. And everybody, it took everybody on that team to be disciplined. Not just the flight lead, not just the element lead, not just the wing. Everybody. The crew chiefs the maintenance crews, the munitions guys. Everybody had to have that same discipline because the survival of, of us in the air depended on all of them. Teamwork, extremely important. One for all, all for one. It really means something. Now what General Ritchie didn't say when he was talking about the pickup of Roger Locker. Raj was shot down on the 10th of May. He was in the lead of the formations that we were in. And Roger was my roommate. And I watched him get shot down. Not very easy to go back to the room that night. Or the next. Or the next. They say, never make friends in combat. You make your best friends in combat. Because the person standing next to you, his friend, is the person keeping you alive, and vice versa. So that was a tough mission that day. <clears throat> Very successful, but also a failure. We'd gotten three MiG kills on the 10th of May and lost one of ours. On an economic sense, it wasn't a very successful ex exchange. Numbers-wise, it was. Later on, when we got him out, kind of even the score. Now, we were definitely a team. Of course, in the airplane, the F-4 takes two people to fly it well. And if they're not married up exactly, then the team doesn't work well. Because when General Ritchie cleared his throat or made some disparaging remark, I didn't know what he meant. You know? You know, the last thing you wanted is uh, two sets of thoughts going on in that cockpit. And we were pretty much in the same mindset. But it didn't stop there. The four airplanes in the formation, the eight guys, all had to be focused for the same mission same goal, knowing that we were going to go in, complete the mission, <clears throat> and we were going to go home. The tankers, the bombers, the F-4 carrying bombs, the weasels, the F-105s with the uh, going after the SAMs, the command posts, everybody had to be focused on that mission, and we were. But it also went back to the base, because if the crew chiefs didn't do their jobs, the maintenance crews didn't do their jobs, the mission, munitions guys didn't make sure the missiles worked, then we were up there for nothing. But it also included the guys that, and gals that made sure we got fed, we got paid. You know, it's a big team, just like it is today. It's a big team. 
integrity was extremely important. And when you're in the heart of heartland of the enemy, integrity becomes extremely important. If you tell me you're going to do something, then damn it, do it. Or tell me you're not going to do it. But don't let me go in expecting something to happen and then have it not happen. You may have just killed somebody. Honesty, a must. Trust, a must. We were leading the uh, formation in one day. DC Vest was uh, running the shaft lights, and we were in front of them. And as we coming down, as we get in, we're going in by Haiphong Harbor. As we get closer and closer to the coast, the weather was a sloping cloud deck, and we hadn't even got to the uh, beach yet to inbound to, into North Vietnam, and we were down to about three, four hundred feet, which is not where you want to take. Uh, a mast strike. And uh, so we radioed back that the weather was uh, not optimum for anybody. And they canceled the mission. The flight lead for the chaff flight, who was going to lead the, lay the, the trail in for the bombers to come into, said, We canceled. And he turned the, the formation around. And all of a sudden, the command post in the sky. Controllers there want to know who gave the word to cancel. It didn't matter. We weren't going in that day. We canceled the formation. And it stood canceled. There was no way to get it turned around again. Nor did any of us want to. I mean, they, they didn't see the big picture. We did. Now, we didn't feel like we were empowered, although we didn't use that word at that time. But we knew we wanted the head of that spear. And with the team that we had going, we could very definitely give the enemy a good jab with that spear. We were all dedicated to what we did, and it all made a big difference. Because we were there for a reason. When I joined the Air Force, I took an oath support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That oath hasn't changed. My commitment to that oath, to that flag, to the Constitution of this United States has not changed. Now at that time we were all young, mid-twenties, full of piss and vinegar.